So today uh, we're going to be talking about the Prophet Joel. So th this is going to get quite personal uh, because uh, some of you might know that I celebrated 20 years as a Christian this mm -hmm. week. And I, I wanted to do something that spoke to me. And I was speaking to Kieran about this earlier in the week. It's, this is not what I plan to do as often the way the spirit works. Uh, I was reading a book by Steve Kennard, some of us might know from New York, and it's about the, the minor prophets, and the first chapter was on the prophet Joel, and as soon as I started reading it, I thought this would make a great lesson, and I pray you find it a great lesson, and it's, it's going to have lots of practicals, and uh, thank you again, I think I sent a message the other week, I, I'm really grateful for all of you being part of my journey, and everybody's contributed to remaining sane and on the right route, on the narrow path. Uh, so, but we'll go ahead. So the, the, the next one, if you click on your board, should be the picture of a microphone. So uh, Prezi, like uh, Windows, has different backgrounds and different templates. And I thought this would be appropriate, appropriate because one of the things we know about Joel is he is a prophet. And uh, the title of the sermon today, the message, is Joel the Prophet of Zion's Future. That's Joel, the prophet of Zion's future. So we're going to look at some of the background about Joel just now. So you go to the next slide, you should say background uh, with the prophet Joel on it. And even if you click on the prophet Joel, you should make it larger. It should be able to see it in full screen. It gives you some uh, of the things like uh, darkness, day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is something really to think about as we go through this me uh, message. It's something very apparent uh, that comes up in the Old Testament, and we'll be discussing that as we go along. So I'm going to give you some uh, background. Uh, there's not much we know about Joel apart from what's in the the book. The sorry, in, in the book of Joel, but what we do know is there's a theme uh, to the to his book, and it's the Day of the Lord. Uh, but that I've put down the Day of the Lord is a day of destruction and a day of hope. So the day of the Lord is a day of destruction, and a day of hope. Interestingly enough, uh, the chapters of Joel, is almost like you could split it in half, like a book of two halves. Uh, the first half of the book talks a lot about destruction. It talks a lot about the plague of locusts that totally destroy the land. While the second half is much more uplifting and positive. It talks a lot about repentance, it talks about the future, uh, which we'll go into as we take the communion together. Uh, but it is very much split down the middle. The audience who Joel was preaching to and uh, is Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, Joel, uh, I think there's 12 characters called Joel in the Bible, uh, the, the, but only one that has a book named after him. And his name means Yahweh is God. That's Yahweh is God. Uh, to give you an outline, this is really helpful when I read this. Uh, so it's definitely split into two. So the first part of the book of Joel from Joel 1 to Joel 2.17, uh, the outline is that the scourge of locusts and drought and the call to repentance. That's the scourge of locusts and drought and the call to repentance. The second half from chapter 2.18 to chapter 3.21 is promise of blessings through restoration. That's promise of blessings through restoration. Uh, the historical context, which is always important, uh, Joel prophesies during the period of political and economic calm for Judah. The people were not concerned with outside threats to their security. So this is important, and I think they believe this is why God used this very powerful weapon of the locusts to get the people's attentions because they'd fall into idolatry. They, they weren't keeping God's commands. They're living in a period where their security was not threatened. You could argue they're becoming complacent in their faith. And yet what does God do? He provides this incredible locust of, uh, sorry, plague of locusts. And this is very apparent for the, the, the period of the Near East or the Far East at this time. Uh, there was locusts throughout, and you can imagine this is an agricultural society that was totally dependent on their crops. So these locusts would come in and devastate acres of crops and totally flatten their harvest. So this would have very much got the people's attention in the first part of Joel. 
So uh, the first point today should be on your next slide. Thank you. Which should read, prepare. So point one is prepare. Uh, the scripture I'll be reading from, and this to keep you, if you have your Bible open, it's quite straightforward apart from some uh, references. We'll be in Joel 3 uh, for the three points, and then we'll move on to Joel 2 for the communion message. So I'll be reading uh, Joel for chapter 3, verse 9 to verse 12. And this is point one, prepare. Proclaim this among the nations, prepare for war, rouse the warriors, <coughs> let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Now that's verse 10, I put a note under that. Some of you work, might well recognize that, but it's in reverse. So this is the opposite of Isaiah 2.4. So that's verse 10 is the opposite of Isaiah 2, chapter 2, verse 4. And it continues, let the weakling say, I am strong. Come quickly, all you nations from every side and assemble there. Bring down your warriors, Lord, let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the valley, Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. So this is from Joel 3 verse 9 to verse 12. So the first thing I want us to think about is, is the day of the Lord and how we need to prepare. So the day of the Lord is not just one day. Uh, as Christians, as believers in Christ, it should be every day of our life. And every day we need to prepare. The question is, how do we prepare? What does it take to be prepared? It takes time. And it takes effort. There's something we often tell our children. Uh, if you want to practice or be good at something, it takes time and it takes effort. So the first point we'll be looking at is time. We have to give time to invest in our relationship with God. Bible study and prayer will not be excellent unless consistent time is devoted to them. This is something that I have and those of you who know me have a lot of conviction about. Um, I see my desperate need for this, to get into God's words every day. And if I'm gonna get into God's words every day on a consistent basis, therefore I have to put time aside and put in effort to help me. This has been over the last 20 years that I've done this and the, the, the odd day I miss, often when we're in transit or, or something unusual happens, I feel it. I'll be honest with you, if I don't get my time with God through his word every day, every morning, then I, I really miss it. So we need time and we need effort in our relationship with God. The other thing that we need is also time in relationships. Uh, this is something that that has helped me along the way. And I'm gonna share a lot about what has helped me uh, to keep me faithful for 20 years. I know some of you out there and some of you maybe listening to this recording have been a disciple of Jesus a lot longer and some of you considerably less time. But these are the things that have helped me over the past 20 years, to put in time and effort into the word of God every day. And I said also time into relationships. A few years ago, uh, our dear brother Bob mostly moved up here I can't even remember how many years Bob had been a disciple, but I still remember to this day uh, one church meeting we had and he approached me and he said, Could, would you be in a discipling relationship with me? And I'll, I'll admit to you at the time I was really taken back because I thought here's a brother who's older in years and older in the Lord with me and yet he saw his need and humbly asked to be in a discipling relationship. So from that day to this, myself and Bob, have, under various guises and different locations, have got together at least once a fortnight. And because we know each other, I find it a lot easier uh, to, to talk about what's on my heart, to strip away the, the masks that we often wear, and also to confess sin, uh, to, to, you know, to share about what we're learning, God's message. And there's also, it's not just Bob, there's other people that are listening to this uh, that have helped me 
and uh, continue to do so. So I just really encourage you uh, to invest in relationships. I'm very aware we can't be really uh, close to everybody, even in a small church, but those that you have and you feel close to, I really urge you to in invest. And if you can, to have a discipling relationship where you can have regular time and consistent times with one another where you can speak on, on a spiritual level and help one another in the faith. Uh, because this has, has helped me enormously and continues to help me as well. <clears throat> so the second part of this is effort. So part one is time, the second part is effort. And now I'm going to share a quote uh, from the book from Steve Kennard, uh, which sums this up really well and puts it in right perspective. It says, you don't earn salvation, but you must put effort into living a righteous life. That's you don't earn salvation, but you must put effort in to living a righteous life. Uh, an example that I chose for this, I think Steve chose the same, is uh, mine and Wendy's engagement. Um, I put a lot of effort into it, not surprisingly. Uh, I decided that uh, I wanted us to get engaged in, in, in the Isle of Arran, where my family's from. First time Wendy would ever been to the island. And uh, just even shows preparation doesn't always work considerably because uh, we planned to go the night before on the Friday night in the winter in January. It was blowing an absolute gale. Uh, we got on the train and then they told us to move to another train because the ferry was going to get uh, it's going to get uh, moved from the usual location in Drossen and further up the coast um, to to uh, and 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 therefore we were actually ended up on the wrong train. We were going north and the ferry was going south to its normal place. And it was only when I phoned my dad to tell me we'd be delayed uh, because of where the ferry was landing, they told me, no, the ferry's actually going to Drossen. So I had everything prepared for the next Saturday morning early on. And here's me starting to get very nervous. And Wendy's saying, don't worry about it, it's no big deal. And I'm thinking, it's a big deal. <laughs> and I'll get engaged tomorrow morning, that's the plan. I prepared everything. So a lot of prayer was given in there, miraculously, uh, the ferry waited in, in Drossen. We took a, a taxi about 30, 40 miles down the coast. It waited an hour for all the other people who got on the wrong train. And we went over. Uh, the, the waves were crazy. There's people being ill left, right, and center. And But we got there. We managed to get there on the island. Late, a uh, bit bedraggled, but all right. But the irony, the next day, the Saturday morning in January, the storm just died down. It was a beautiful, sunny day. Uh, I said, asked Wendy if we can go on a prayer walk around the island, uh, particularly around the castle, the castle ruins where my sister lived. I'd prepared in advance to get, uh, the castle's usually all closed in the winter, prepared in advance uh, to get my sister to open the castle. I prepared the music, some of Wendy's favorite music, on a, on a, that was a recording device that I'd hidden in the castle. I'd asked my parents to get the flowers, and uh, when it came to Wendy's uh, time to pray, she said, can I pray now? I said, no, which at one point she realized something's going on here. <laughs> went to the castle, uh, went down on bended knees. And, and those of you who know Wendy knows, know she's, uh, uh, she's, she's yes, uh, an educator and a linguist, and she likes her grammar correctly. Uh, <laughs> when we started dating, she asked me if that was a question, uh, which I thought was obvious. And she had the same thing in mind. Uh, when, when I was on my knee on the gravel with the flowers and the music going on, but she thought better and just said yes. <laughs> so that, that was amazing. But like, like many things, I put a lot of effort into that to try and make it special for Wendy, to make it special memory for us. And it paid off. So, yeah. so uh, but, you know, but there's an interesting question about that. And uh, you can only ask yourself this, do you put more effort into other areas of your life compared to your relationship with God? That's do you put more effort into other areas of your life compared to your relationship with God? And I put in a reference here that came to mind when I wrote this question, and it's in Luke 12, 34, which says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So that's the end of point one. Uh, where we looked at prepare 
and we put time and effort. Point two is, a, and you can move on to the next slide, which should read, respond. And under it, there should be a scripture that reads it's simply in Joel 3, verse 13. That's point two is on respond. Joel 3, 13 reads, swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come trample the grapes, for the wine press is full and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. So the important thing to take out of this verse is particularly the word harvest. It says, swing the sickle for the harvest is ripe. The question is, how do you respond to God's word? How do you, how do you respond in general to God? Or how, how do I respond to God? So Joel teaches us a valuable lesson. When the harvest is ready, the crops must be harvested. Again, as I said earlier, this was an agricultural nation and society and community. They would have totally understand this question about harvest and the importance to swing the sickle when the harvest is ripe. Any of us who's grown anything, tried to grow it in the garden or, or seen it grown, will be aware there is a time for ripeness. Uh, for us, we've got a, a small uh, strawberry plants in our garden and uh, it's an interesting analogy because often at the time that they're the most ripest, we've often been away. So we've obviously tried to harvest them before we leave and even asked our neighbours after we leave to please pick the strawberries when they're ripe because they're just going to get eaten by the birds or the worms and they're going to go to waste. And it's a really tragic thing to see crops go to waste and it would have been a serious life issue uh, for the people at this time if they'd not uh, swung the heart, sorry, they'd not picked the harvest when the grains was ripe. Again, you can see the connection to the locust, God's still working on this analogy. The harvest would have been totally destroyed uh, from this, but in the second part of this, uh, there's a, a lean towards repentance and hope in the future. So we must respond to God. A, a prophet like Joel responds to God's call, do we? So that's the question, a prophet responds to God's call, do we? And I think there's many ways in which we can respond. We can respond to the, the spirit that's within us. We can respond to the word. We can respond to life circumstances in a righteous and godly way. But God's calls there to be a response. And his time when the harvest is ripe is the time to respond. So that's the second point. The first point is appreciate the results. That's point three is appreciate the results. So I'll be reading from Joel 3, verse 14 to verse 21. That's Joel 3, 14 to 21. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will be darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble, but the Lord will be, be a refuge for his people a stronghold for the people of Israel, blessings for God's people. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. In that day, the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines from Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Achaeus. But Egypt will be desolate, Edom a desert waste, because of a violence done to the, the people of Judah, in whose land they shed innocent blood. Judah will be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem through all generations. Shall I leave their innocent blood, blood un unavenged? No, I will not. The Lord dwells in Zion. Mm -hmm. Here are the promises of God, and remember this was a fickle people, uh, as Bob uh, referred to this uh, last week, he talked a lot about the repetition, which happens throughout the Old Testament, particularly the prophets, where the people would go astray, they would be punished by God in some way, often by other nations, they would repent, but then they'd fall again into the sin. 
Yet God shows his patience and love by giving them hope in the future. So this, this the particular latter part of this, uh, particularly from 17 to 21 talks about the, the blessings for God's people and also how he's going to avenge those who have attacked them. There's another point to think about, particularly as we live in this emotional time and pandemic, about are we leaving judgment to God? Are we leaving his judgment to him when maybe governments or, or leaders that, 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 that we struggle with, with their ideas and the way going about things, or do we want the recrimination now? Do we judge because God promised that every day, every knee will bow and he will judge all people for what they've done on this earth. But this point is point three, which is appreciate the results. This is something that's helped me enormously uh, and I've touched on before, is remembering the blessings from God. Remembering, you know, 20 years ago, I was a single man and uh, I was still in love with a woman. Some of you know, Ellie, who was, became a disciple before me. And, uh, but that wasn't God's plan. I saw uh, Barney, my best friend at the time, one of my best friends in the kingdom. And that, there was a lot of heartache for me the first few years as a Christian. But God was preparing a, a wife and a, for me. And he, he knew what I wanted. He knew what Wendy wanted. It was his timing. And uh, many times I didn't think I'd be married. Uh, before I was a Christian, even as a Christian, I thought there's no assurance here. And there was men, and I always wanted to be married. I always wanted to have children. And uh, I didn't even think that would be possible. Yet God has blessed me with two beautiful boys uh, who mm -hmm. gave me great delight and joy. And greatest prayer for them is they could follow in our footsteps and give themselves entirely to the Lord and leave a legacy on this earth. But it keeps me going to be thankful when times of trouble come, which they will, when times of hardship come, which they will, we look back and we are thankful for all that God has done for us. To be ready for the day of the Lord, you have to be thankful for everything God has done for you in your life. And often this includes, to be honest, the difficult times. Because in hindsight, when we look back, this is often the times we've most grown in our faith. We've grown closer to God as a result of these times. We've grown deeper in our conviction. It's led to perseverance and greater faith. God promises that he will bless us. That's one of his assurances from his promises. He will bless us. But are we really and truly grateful for God's blessing? Do we remember mm -hmm. them? Do we give him the glory straight away? Are we grateful? Let us always remember to thank him, to praise him, and to give him the honor. So in conclusion, and before we move on to communion, uh, I'd like to simply say, being ready for the day of the Lord is a daily decision. But there's also a caveat in there. But beware, there is always a real danger of becoming complacent in our spiritual lives. Because if I'm totally honest, there's definitely been times over the last 20 years when I have been complacent in, in my relationship with God. I maybe took it for granted, maybe too easily. I maybe not felt, maybe you can, can uh, associate with this, as close to God as I know that I should. But with great assurance, I remember that God is still close to me, but maybe I've just drifted a bit from him. So if you're going through the period like this just now, or you've experienced that, don't worry. I think this is part of our life as a disciple of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, the times of feast and the times of famine and times of great joy. So with, with that, I'm going to take us to the cross. And here, again, we could move to communion. And the scripture is Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to verse 32. And as I read this, some of this will seem very apparent to you. And I'll, I'll give you the reference because this is referred to directly in the New, New Testament and ties in very well uh, to the hope and repentance uh, that we can have through the blood of Jesus. So it's Joel 2, 28 to 32, which is entitled The Day of the Lord. And afterwards, 
I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on the Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance. As the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. So again, context, context. It's always important to remember the context of this passage in the book of Joel. This is after the locusts had ravaged and savaged the land and destroyed it. There's always hope. But here the prophet Joel is looking to a much further place and time in the future for the time of Jesus. Consider this passage. One of the, the interesting facts about Joel is there's lots of discrepancy about when it was actually written. Nobody really knows. But what we do know, it was written hundreds and hundreds of years before the time of Christ. It looks to the future through symbolic language and describes a time when God will usher in a new age. If this passage sounds familiar to you, it's because Peter quotes this directly in its entirety in Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 17 to 21. That's Acts 2, verse 17 to 21. On, and this is on the occasion of the outpouring of the Spirit. And for those of you, 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 I'm sure you know your Bible quite well, will acknowledge that the Spirit came as a result of Jesus wanting us to not be on our own. He knew, particularly those closest to him, would miss, obviously, his leadership, his, his example, all these things. And he knew that people would struggle without him. But what he promised us and what happened in Acts 2 was a fulfillment of this as the spirit descended upon man and a new age had dawned. This is a new age of Christ. A new age of God's rule began on the first Pentecost after, of course, after the resurrection of Jesus. Again, this is only possible because Jesus not only came, lived amongst us and died, but was risen on the third day. Amen. And he left us the spirit. This is the hope that we have. And the risen Christ. So if you have uh, your bread and your wine just now, I will give you a moment to collect these things and hopefully if, if the audio still works, I asked Kieran uh, last week, hopefully he's still there listening, uh, if he would kindly uh, place a bit of acoustic guitar as we take the bread and the wine. So we'll just Check just now. So get your bread and wine just ready. We'll see if we can get Kieran on the guitar. I will. Okay. Can you? So whenever you're ready, Kieran. Can you hear? Can you hear? I can hear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Amen. Go for it, Kieran. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. 